Hey, hey. Welcome to the Awoken Word Podcast. This is your host, Anu Drastogi. I am excited because today I'm sharing with you my first guest interview of the show. Our guest today is Raj Sharma, and this conversation is a very special one for me. It's special because Raj is one of the country's top refugee and immigration lawyers, and he's been doing some really incredible work for the past 14 years and changing people's lives in some really meaningful ways. It's also a particularly special episode for me because Raj is one of my oldest and dearest friends. He and I met way back in around 96 or 97 when we were both doing our undergrad. We've had a lot of great adventures together and a lot of amazing road trips and all sorts of memories. And the two of us were one seriously kick-ass debate team. He moved on to do a lot of amazing things in his career and he's put his talents to good use. And I was lucky to have Raj over that night as he was actually in Toronto for a special panel interview with the CBC on its primetime show, The National. He was actually here as an expert to help demystify and talk a little bit more about this entire issue that's now arising in this country around border crossers. And uh, it's a big news story. It's definitely something important and topical, but I think that there was a whole bunch of nuance that even I wasn't aware of, and Raj really kind of shed some light on it for me. Anyhow, the theme I wanted to tackle in this conversation with Raj was really something that's universal, and that is home. I thought it would be interesting to talk to Raj about this idea because in his world, he's constantly in a high-stakes emotional situation, helping people from all walks of life who are trying to flee or leave a home or trying to find a new home. And home is something that we often take for granted, and we think about it as a place to go and to feel comfortable and safe. But what if home is the place that you have to leave for no fault of your own, and in many cases, very suddenly, without even having a chance to say goodbye? What does that do to your relationship with this idea of home? This conversation was recorded on September 4th, and it isn't yet aware of some of the crazy things that have happened in the world since the alleged killing of journalist Jamal Khashoggi by the Saudi regime, and this whole Brett Kavanaugh debacle that was the top of the news cycle for several weeks. On the day we recorded, Colin Kaepernick's Nike ad had just come out, and we were here at home learning that the Supreme Court had just blocked the Kinder Morgan pipeline. As for our conversation, I'll let you know in advance that Raj casually throws in a lot of Hindi, Punjabi, and Sanskrit terms, so you might just need to pull out that Sanskrit dictionary. He raises some very interesting and insightful points about how it's not just the fear of the other, but also the fear of a perceived loss of losing one's home that's been particularly important and misunderstood today. And throughout the conversation, you'll hear the clinking of glasses, Uh, I had just made a couple of my signature Old Monk rum with thumbs up cola drinks and I had just made some bitters as well and it was glorious, if I can say so. Anyhow, I really enjoyed this conversation and without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, here you go, Raj Sharma. This podcast is my humble attempt to bring a full grain of sand of goodness to the beach of human experience. Inspiring. This podcast is my love letter to all of you. The Awoken Word Podcast. So we're joined here today by uh, a dear friend of mine, Raj Sharma. Raj, welcome. The honor is mine. So Raj, tell us tell us your story, everything that kind of led up to being here professionally. What's your background? Where did you grow up? Professionally, I'm an immigration lawyer. I have my practice. My firm is in Calgary. I'm in Toronto right now at my close and one of my oldest friend's house. Um, Came here for an interview, uh, media interview. So great opportunity for us to reconnect. And uh, as always, you helped me prepare for the interview. So that was great. Before that, I was uh, born in Hamilton, Ontario. Came out to the West, grew up in BC, interior BC. Uh, went to school in Edmonton. That's where we met. 
and then started practicing law. Uh, prior to that, I was a refugee protection officer in Calgary. So I've been in Calgary for the last uh, 15 plus years. Okay. So it's uh, the theme I want to really hit on today with you is, is kind of, it's on the beaten path, but yet off. And it's really around this idea of home. And I just thought that it would be interesting to get your perspective on home, not just as an individual who has a home and, and goes home, but also as someone who on a day-to-day basis is dealing with people who are wrestling with this question of home. Well, you know, you know, you asked me about this and I was like wondering what could I as a immigration and refugee lawyer talk about home? I mean, from my clients, the concept is to leave home and perhaps to create a new home. But for for me, is is the concept of if it's a refugee, then it's loss. Mm-hmm. It, it's a it's a deep seated loss, right. and so refugees are by definition, uh, they're leaving home not because they want to leave home, be, but because circumstances force them to leave home, and so that's a deep aching loss. It's a wound that festers. It's a wound that perhaps never really heals itself. So. Again, these are these are loaded terms. When you say that the term home, what does that mean to me? I mean, you know, personally or professionally, from a professional point of view, if we're talking about refugees that are perhaps torn away from home, on the other end of the spectrum, I have I represent individuals, perhaps children born in Canada, that are at the end of their road and they are being forced to leave the only home they know, which is Canada. So. Mm. You know, just last month, I I lost a a hearing. I lost a a stay application. It was three very small children, two born in Canada that after eight years were going back to Lebanon and they had never been to Lebanon before. So they were being taken away from the only home that they know. So for me, when you say home, it's like, okay, well, if it's refugees, then they're forced to leave home behind. And this is a, a loss that and perhaps a regret that will follow them for the rest of their lives or it will be other clients that are losing their home in Canada and both are very very tragic right and so you know my my relationship with that term is a complex relationship right so i mean you keep using the word term and let's like sort of back up just to set the the playing field here um, I, I was looking up definitions of the word home, and, and Wikipedia has this definition as a, a home being a domicile or a living space used uh, as a permanent or semi-permanent residence for an individual, family, household, or several families in a tribe. What does the word home mean to you as you know, as an individual, as, as Raj Sharma? Well, it's probably not the definition that's found in Wikipedia, I guess. I think home is more of a, I think, a state of mind. So home for me was, for example, our parents were working in the coal mine and our nanny, my nanny, my cousins, Daddy, um, took care of us in a mobile home in Elkford. And there was seven kids running around in a, in a mobile home um, while this old lady took care of us, taught us Punjabi and 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 made us sag and makki di roti. And, and that was, if I were to say, like, well, that's not technically my home. That was my cousin's home. But home to me, if that was my deep, deepest, you know, recesses of my soul, probably would be that place. But then there's, I think, other homes. I think home is a state of mind for me. And home is probably a state of mind for my clients. So home is this ideal that they have left and And they may gloss over, they've put that home on a pedestal and they may not ever remember the flaws, but it's that home and this ideal that they've left behind and there's this longing. And then they're trying to create a home here or there's clients who this is the only home they know and then they're leaving this place for the unknown. And I think my definition of home would be a little bit different. I would say that it is a... It is very much subjective. It would be based on, I believe that it's a state of mind. I believe that, you know, that concept is flexible and fluidic. And and to some, that concept of home or that loss could define the rest of their lives. And that would be even more tragic. Right. 
Um, but I think we're defined by our tragedies rather than our successes and victories. I don't know if you experienced this growing up. I mean, we're both Indian ethnic background, you know, second generation here, but I found I hadn't been to, uh, back to India. I was just about to say home, but I, I hadn't been back to India for about almost 22 or 23 years from since childhood until just after I got married. And what was really funny is that when I'm here and people ask me where, you know, my background, I'll say I'm Indian. Mm. And when I was there, I was telling people I was from Canada or I was Canadian. Well, you know, for me, India can never be home because I was kicked out of India. We we talked about that just before we started recording. So once you're kicked out of a place that can never be your home and can never be regarded as home, uh, that'll probably be a story for another podcast. But, you know, long story short... I had to somehow get deported from India um, over a sort of picky you and minor error in computation, perhaps my fault, uh, disproportionate response perhaps by the Indian authorities. But India can never be home for me because home can never be a place that you can be kicked out of. Does it matter who's doing the kicking out? Like if it's one faction, one element, someone in a in a government or it's a, it's a betrayal. I mean, the concept of home is requires the issue of trust, right? And so once there's a betrayal of trust, um, there's the betrayal of that concept. What does the phrase "feel at home" mean to you? When we think about home, you, you often hear these phrases like "feel at home" or you know, making this house a home or something. So it's not just a structure, it's not a cave, it's not a building necessarily, although that may be an intrinsic part of it. I kind of want to get a, a better sense of that because you talk to people I don't, all the time I don't know. wrestling I mean, with if this. You're, if you're talking about personally, I mean, you've caught me in a transition point in my life. I, it's going to be tough for me to even comment about what home means to me. In terms of my clients, I think home is a security. So why do people uproot themselves and strive off or seek out the unknown, which is could be very, very dangerous. So no one willingly, in my opinion, uproots themselves from everything that they know, their language, their family, and just for a gamble. Um, so that striving and that attempt ultimately, and, and I don't know if necessarily they're looking for a home. I think what they're doing is they're looking for something greater than themselves or a concept and they perhaps can't even put that into words um for example you and i went to 269 pape avenue today right so my father left india in 1970 and after the death of his father and he had told his father that he was going to leave india and my father's from one of the most backward parts of the punjab and this concept would have been ludicrous to most people so but after he achieved his master's degree and he was a lecturer and he was at Punjabi University and Khalsa College in Patiala, he came to Canada, he qualified for immigration, but he ended up a series of misadventures, much like his son, perhaps, <laughs> a series of misadventures. And um, a helpful Romanian taxi driver took him to the Gurdwara at uh, 269 Pape Avenue. And he was there for a couple of days. And that was this sort of place of security. And that's where he was able to view his surroundings and make the necessary decisions to start his life in Canada. Now, I'm not sure if my father came to Canada looking to make a home here. I think he came here with perhaps other objectives, perhaps to make money, perhaps to make his mark in the world, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And I think over time and eventually he realized and certainly you know he came here when he was 27 or 28 years old he was in Canada far longer than he was in India and eventually at one point and not in the not too distant past he went to India and realized that India was not his country it was not his home anymore right so home yeah. sometimes in, is an accretion i.e. It, it's a patina it 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 develops over time. I, I don't think there's a sudden, you know, realization that this is home. I mean, perhaps there's love at first sight. I'm not sure if there's home at first sight. That's an interesting concept. Even with my own parents, I know 
at this point, they've spent far more time outside of India than they've spent in it. I mean, they left actually when they were very young, both of them sort of independently before they knew each other had moved to Europe and they were in Europe almost 10 years each before, you know, getting married and coming to Canada. And what's what's interesting is that home, especially for people who've come from a, in, in any sort of a diasporic experience, right, is this this idyllic romanticized place that you left and you may have left for any number of reasons, right? It could have been, um, you know, war had befallen the country. It's, it's it the pedestal. Anything. It's it's your, it's your first love, right? Right. The, yeah. The, the flaws are glossed over. The flaws are diminished, right? Well, it's it's also I think maybe at the time that you may have left, like they left when they were fairly young, and maybe they still had a very romantic notion of of what it was like, and that the the struggle outside that maybe was supposed to be the promised land was actually that much more difficult than they expected. But, you know, in, in the same way that you're mentioning about your father, like my own mother, it's the same thing. Like when she thinks of India and she thinks of home from that context, she remembers what it was like when the population of the country was 400 million, when it wasn't and, and necessarily promise, the and, state and, that it and, was and today. India, India had a certain degree of promise in the 1970s. Right, right. And, you know, it, it's it's gone through all, as many places do, it's gone through all sorts of changes that, you know... At Pre-emergency. Rates, yeah, pre nineteen eighty four. Yeah, pre many many different. You know, I know we're in post globalization with call center and you know IT culture and all of these other things that have just kind of changed. And yet, when she thinks about it, like her thing is, this is not the home that I knew, right? Well, so she's home, she's not the right. person she was. Sure. She just doesn't realize it. She's not the eighteen year old girl right. that left. Exactly. That home where her father and her brothers treated her undoubtedly like a princess. Right. So she's not the same person that she was. That home is not the home that it was. She just doesn't realize that the frames of reference have changed irrevocably. Well, I think we we all do that in some in in some way shape or form. Like we'll romanticize certain parts of our life or memory and whatnot. We'll well we may sort of look at it through rose-colored glasses in in a different way than um, like if you were to actually go back into some of those times that you romanticize, it might not actually be so great, but it's easy to kind of remove the bad from your memory because it, it feels either convenient or it creates well, a certain sort of... Psychologically, feeling. we have a tendency to forget uh, pain. So I, I'm, uh, I, I'm fascinated, I think, particularly in the current climate today. By the way, uh, if the listeners are hearing any sort of tinkle of sort of glass or ice cubes. This is, uh, my friend has made me Old Monk rum with thumbs up with some bitters in it. And uh, again, reminding us of home. Last yeah. time I had this was in Goa. So cheers to that. No, uh, absolutely. This uh, this kind of reminds me of a home I never lived in, but. that That's right. I think, you know, that concept is interesting as well. You can be reminded of a home that you've never lived in as, either because you can, you can create certain touchstones. Like, for example, I mean, I imported a 1971 Hindustan ambassador from India, and I drive this around. Now, obviously, you know, I've never, this has nothing to do with me. This car has very little to do with me, but it does remind me of home. And I was thinking about it. I was like, you know, I remember working on this old Volvo that my dad had and when I was a kid. And, yeah, it had these round lights and headlights and actually kind of looks like the ambassador am i trying to recreate a memory of me and my father working on a sort of relatively primitive car that looks like the ambassador and, and i remember going to india and my dad would get an ambassador and we would he'd probably just buy one and then we'd drive it around and again i was very very young so you know me, perhaps again um i'm trying to recreate home by you know in this case, importing a 1971 Hindustan ambassador. So and, I think for all the listeners who don't know, the ambassador, I believe, was the first fully like made in India automobile, like or at right. least on any mass scale. Right. I mean, it, it's in reality, it's a it's an Oxford Series Two, and right. uh, so Birla Motors basically just bought the factory from England and just moved it over and started producing these. Uh, cars, beautiful cars, but they in fifty years they never changed the design, um, right. and obviously suffered when the market opened up to other cars and other manufacturers. So, right, um, yeah, it was a it was an odd uh, it was an odd sort of fixation and an odd that I did it, and perhaps I did the ambassador as some sort of homage to either 
you know, these long gone or long or half remembered memories from India. And so again, evocative of home, let's say. Right. So I'm, I've been kind of fascinated with this idea of kind of talking about home largely because this has become even more um, newsworthy of recent with all of the different crises that have we have somehow created for ourselves. Um, you, know, you know, you you understand, of course, we are living in almost unprecedented times. There's sure. millions of individuals that are displaced from right. their homes right now. Right. We have millions displaced from Syria. We have now uh, millions displaced from Venezuela. So we are living in these sort of unprecedented times where unwillingly individuals are leaving behind their homes and their ties and their families. And it is... We are living perhaps in an age of heartbreak that we have not encountered perhaps in decades. It was interesting, particularly as it comes to all of these different refugee crises and, and what ends up manifesting itself in the, in the far right and populist movements, Brexit, the rise of the far right in the isn't, U.S. Is, in this isn't, country. Isn't Brexit a reaction against? Isn't Brexit, this isn't my country anymore? Isn't yeah. Brexit a reaction of I want my home to be what it was or my father's home to be what it was? I mean, isn't Brexit a sort of knee-jerk reaction against the tides of globalization, the tides of free movement? Right. But what's what's really interesting about that is there's accounts of people who are second, third generation immigrants in the UK, for example, that might be of South Asian descent or any other ethnicity there. And they voted for Brexit. Who voted for Brexit and are also complaining that the Romanians and the, the, the Romas and the Gypsies are coming in and taking our jobs and whatnot. So that same sort of sentiment that you would have expected from an otherwise sort of nativist a background is coming even from people who are second and third generation. No, no, but I mean, hold from... on, no, no, like, I mean, at that point, like, okay, we expect individuals to integrate. We expect this is our country now. So why wouldn't I react the same way, for example, as, or why wouldn't my son react? Fair point. Yeah, I mean, fair point. I mean, if, if they are Britishers, if they are from the UK and they feel that their concept of home is being disrupted or it's not the same, I mean, that sentiment should be respected. I, Again, you know, I was on, there's a media interview today as well. And so I want to be respectful of these feelings and these concepts. And so we had this, you know, UNHCR representative is like, oh, what's the big deal? This is nothing compared to Bangladesh, the inflow for Canada. But, well, Canada is not living next to Burma. Right. Canada is living next to the U.S. And it's bordered by two oceans and the Arctic to the north. And so, you know, this concept of, and when we strike at that, a person's conception of home. And when you seek to perhaps, or perception, the perception is a radical change, it strikes a chord. And that is that nativist sentiment. And so we have to be, even in immigration, as an immigration lawyer, we have to be cautious here because you could strike that chord and it could lead to nativist sentiment, which could then also change that concept of home, which for me is Canada is this welcoming, right. inclusive environment. So uh, we're living in an age that's, uh, there's dangers all around us. And right. it's it's difficult to sort of, you know, these are, we're, we're casting pebbles into a lake and there's going to be ripples and there's going to be consequences, f- uh, both foreseen and unforeseen. Right. I want to come back to this notion of Canada being welcoming and and, and kind and generous and all that in in just a moment. But maybe just to kind of set the well, look, the Canada's stage. not Disneyland for immigrants or refugees. But uh, despite you know the the warm feelings, the Tim Hortons commercials, and everything to the contrary, right? Well, I, so let's let, maybe just back up for a second because what are some table stakes knowledge that anyone would need to have about the immigration and refugee system in Canada? And what are some, in your eyes, like common misconceptions about how immigration and the system works here? And even in contrast to the U.S., because I know you were telling me some interesting things about the U.S. immigration um, well, policies and system versus Canada well, and how again, different you they know, are. This concept of Canada being a Disneyland for immigrants and refugees, the, the reality is that Canada has a meritocratic immigration system. Very cold and calculating. And they select, and we select, I should say we select our immigrants based on this objective criteria. 
And my father passed this objective criteria in 1970 and included language tests. He still remembers the one word he got wrong. He still remembers the one uh, word that he didn't know the definition of, which was sedan. So we have this meritocratic system, which is cold and calculating. And now it's this express entry system. So basically, it's shadi.com. So shadi.com is you create your profile and your profile is going to be ranked with everyone else in that pool. And then Canada picks the top. So just remember, I don't know if you... It's basically Tinder for like letting in... No, no, no. No, no. I know. Do you remember uh, those uh, Mahabharat and Ramayan serials? Yeah, yeah. So do you remember like the Swamver? There would be a Swamver. Yeah. And there would be a Rajkumari. And the Rajkumari would have the Varmala. And -hmm. then all these princes would come in. And she would go and she would pick one of the Rajkumar, the Var. And she would pick one and she would put the Varmala on him and that's it. Right? And that's what Express Entry is. It's a swimmer. <laughs> All these Var are, are in this pool and we're going to assess them against everyone else. And it is cold-blooded. Very, very calculated. Obviously, it's, it's, it's points-based. And all these countries want to follow our model. The U.S. wants it. The right. U.K. wants it. They want that cold, calculating model. And so friendly Canada and everyone's like, oh, they're so welcoming. Well, that's 60% of our immigra- immigrants so wait, per how, year how is this we... economic class where we gauge people based on their objective criteria, jobs, et cetera, et cetera. 40% is, is family class. My brother can sponsor me, a 41-year-old from Canada, to the U.S. under the family class. I can't sponsor him to Canada because our family class is much more constrained. Um, so in, in, in terms of, again, refugee, again, we're talking about very limited numbers that Canada takes on. So we've got this sort of outsized, perhaps, reputation um, but in reality, we really uh, look to our own interests when we select immigrants. And so by doing that, what that has done is that it allows the native population to be very accepting of refugee, uh, of immigrants. Sorry, It allows them to be accepting of immigrants because they're like, oh, well, we're selecting our own immigrants. Now, we've never had, we, we were then thus smug in terms of the U.S. because, you know, the country to our south is the U.S., and the country to the U.S.'s south is Mexico. So right. they've had to deal with millions of illegal immigrants or unqualified immigrants, and so they, there's been frustrations and, and pent-up issues that we've never had to deal with mm-hmm. because we've been accepting of Mr. Rastogi, mm-hmm. a skilled guy who's created businesses and employment, and Mr. Ram Krishan Sharma, who's done the same. And right. so... Yes, it's very easy to accept immigrants like that. Um, right. And, and so we've been sort of smug and condescending towards our U.S. neighbors, but our experience with immigration has been very, very different. So it's interesting because knowing that the U.S. immigration policies are, at least in some dimensions, more, more generous, maybe even a little bit more, dare I say, even humane in some senses than maybe what, that what we have here, And yet Canada gets off as being, you know, sort of this friendly, cuddly, loving, open, generous country. For whatever reason, we've kind of created this reputation. But having kind of traveled through the U.S. in in a lot of different parts, there's this one particular experience I had in, of all places, in Topeka, Kansas. And uh, I was going there for some work. I flew into Kansas uh, City, drove 70 miles to Topeka. And where we entered Topeka was actually, I forget what part of the city, but we had to pass through the Mexican ghetto. And this Mexican ghetto was literally a whole bunch of farm fields and then some really run-down strip malls, like not even strip malls, like they were barely held together by barn board. And this is where a lot of the um, uh, migrant workers were working the farmlands, a lot of the people who were nannies for, you know, the the upper and, you know, wealthy class in, in Topeka where they would live. This is where you'd get the best Mexican food and whatnot. But whenever I would talk to people there, these people were not seen as sort of a scourge on society. They were sort of essential to keeping a strata of that American society functioning, right? Because without access to that type of labor that was sort of off the record and, and or cheap for them and whatnot, they couldn't have the lifestyle that they, they wanted. I've, I've met, you know, other people who lived in, you know, parts of Texas where 
they'd be gardening, you know, new to the city gardening, you know, coming in from another country and a neighbor would be like, why are you doing that work? You can just go down the street, go to the nearest gas station. You'll find a bunch of Mexicans, find the one that has a truck, pay them a hundred bucks and they'll come and take care of all of this for you. So there's an entire strata in parts of America that's benefiting from that. And I, I, I don't want to call it a symbiotic relationship. Obviously these people that are there are somewhat desperate too, but we don't have some of those dynamics quite in the same way. I know there are migrant, and I hate using that word, but there's sort of people that come up from the West Indies and Jamaica, and they they're in the wine region in Niagara, and they they you know they pick grapes every year, and they, yet they don't get citizenship. So we do have some of those types of scenarios in Canada, but it's not quite to the same extent. So I find it interesting though that we pretend to be on a high horse in Canada, which maybe isn't very deserved. We're just maybe lucky that we've got that reputation. Yeah. I- you know, and the chickens may be coming home to roost. I think um, one, of re- one of the reasons why there's life on Earth, one of the reasons why there's life on Earth is uh, because of the existence of Jupiter. Right. Yeah. So Jupiter has this massive gravitational pull, and there's, an, in fact, this asteroid belt around around that area as well. So all these... Uh, extra solar system bodies that would then come into our solar system and would pummel the inner planets, including Earth, um, don't do so because they're caught up in Jupiter's gravity well. Mm -hmm. And thus life flourished on Earth. The U.S. was Jupiter. The U.S. had this gravitational pull, and so it drew in all legal and illegal migrants, and we were able to perhaps flourish and and pick off some of those sort of desirable immigrants and develop our own policies in that regard. So we've been able, we've been smug because of that. And now, of course, with Donald J. Trump's uh, administration, that gravitational pull is either weakening or repulsing. And so we now will deal with these challenges and these pressures that the U.S., has had to deal with for many decades. So it is going to be an interesting time in terms of immigration. And again, you know, I feel for them as well. Like if you look at those migrant flows, so you've got Honduras, El Salvador, Nicaragua, we're talking about some of the most dangerous countries in the world. We've got Caracas, those Central American, South American countries, higher homicide rates than, you know, war-torn countries. What are you going to do? You know, you've got two kids, I've got two kids. What are you going to do? You're between a rock and a hard place. You would do the same thing that these individuals are doing. And in fact, these individuals that are being apprehended, these families that are being apprehended at the U.S. border, honestly, I would tell them to cross that border and keep heading north. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, when home, and no one leaves home, and then if home becomes, for example, the mouth of a shark, then you kind of have to leave home, no matter how much you love it. It, it can be a love, home can be a love-hate relationship. So right. you could leave home and still always be tied to it. it it's just one of those things. It's like having a, a mother or father that, you know, that there is some negative feelings there, but you can't exactly abandon it either. These are ties that endure. So home is like that. What What do you think is, so, I mean, people could be leaving a place for any number of reasons. There could be uh, an outbreak of civil war. There could be some natural disaster. There could be economic factors and whatnot. But when, uh, when one nation uh, or one group has had, you know, a significant enough direct or indirect impact on another nation that causes a level of unrest or instability and whatnot that forces people to make this tough choice to leave. Do you think that the onus of responsibility changes? Like are are parts of Europe, even in this post-colonial era that have been responsible for cutting up certain countries in Africa or destabilizing parts of the Middle East with certain policies or U S meddling in South America. Is there in your eyes, is there a greater responsibility on the part of those countries to kind of, deal with the aftermath and, and be more generous towards the people that are coming to them? Yeah, whether you uh, whether you want to quote Rudyard uh, Kipling, uh, white man's burden, or whether you want to talk about the revenge of the empire, absolutely. And, and so like, and so when we talk about, for example, let's, let's talk about New Mexico, Texas, and California. 
these were parts of Mexico until mm. not too long ago. So you have a situation where people have not crossed borders, but borders have crossed people. Wow. Okay. That is right. And so you talk about Malcolm X, like we didn't land on Plymouth Rock. Plymouth Rock landed on yes. us. Yeah. You know, absolutely. There's a responsibility. Um, absolutely. And you talk about individuals that the slave trade, you're talking about 400 years of a slave trade. You're talking about uprooting and destroying a culture. And is there an obligation? Absolutely. You're talking about, you know, Mexico and taking over territories that were part of Mexico. And now you're blaming like, well, the demographics in California, New Mexico and Texas and, you know, the Spanish speaking and, oh, this is America. You have to speak English. You're like, well, what America are you talking about? Which borders are you talking about? Right. Because those borders moved and the borders moved more, I think, than the people moved. Right. So, again, we went, we were talking about this for the last little bit about nuance and we're talking about, well, how do you, how do you instruct nuance to uh, individuals that don't know history? Are you familiar with this story of the ship of Thesis? It only got introduced to me through this incredible Indian film by the same name, but it's this, the concept is that if you, over time, replace every single part of a ship, is it still the same ship, mm. right? And I guess in that sense that, like, when you think about any country and every every generation, the old guard is dying and a new guard's emerging, and it is not is not the same place. It is it is a always moving. It's always dynamic. It's transient in a sense, well, right? Well, look, I mean, I haven't read this book or this reference, but. Every cell that we have in our body is has a finite existence, right. and we're they're dying. I mean, every cell and every part of our body is basically replaced. Let's say every couple of years, mm-hmm. I'm still the same Raj. You're still a nudge. I mean, you know, th- these things are the bones are the same, the genetics are the same. You know, I, I think a country is more than just the stock of its people. Or the particular stock of its people. In Canada, and I imagine this has been mirrored to some extent in in other countries too. I mean, you've seen some of this happen in in the UK with Brexit. You've definitely seen the rise of these types of sentiments in in the US. But here in Canada, while people have misconceptions about how there may be some mythical queue, which we know doesn't exist for refugees, for example, or that immigrants are coming in and taking the jobs of people that live here otherwise, or why are we spending money to bring in refugees from other countries when we should be taking care of the people that are here at home or the Aboriginal communities, and some of which are dealing with no clean water or no electricity in parts of the winters and whatnot. As someone in a position of power within uh, the government, you have all of these priorities, and many of them are competing, and you have a finite number of resources. How do we as a society sort of tackle this? How do we go about figuring out what the right thing is to do when? We were talking about earlier about free will. I think um, some decisions are are amenable to variability or, or variance, and I think some decisions aren't. I think in terms of, I think it was almost laughable when, uh, you know, the immigration minister and started talking about, oh, what should the immigration levels be for Canada for the next few years? And I'm like, with Donald Trump in the White House, and with hundreds of thousands of individuals with precarious immigration status in the U.S., we shouldn't be talking about immigration levels or what levels we should set because I think we are going to be uh, playing defensive on that front. Mm-hmm. So certain decisions are up to us and certain decisions are out of our hands. And so I think wisdom is realizing which decisions are ours to make and which decisions are going to be foisted upon us. And so we have to meet each challenge as it comes. When you kind of play out the stats of changes that have happened in, in policy in the U.S. and the impact that that's having, you know, coupled with the fact that we've been largely kind of isolated by, you know, oceans on, on three sides of us, uh, you know, and the Jupiter that's south of us. But now there may well be a, a wave of people who are looking for asylum. They're fleeing whatever circumstances. They no longer have um, maybe the the promising option of, of the U.S. and now Canada is, is, is a possible option. And we may have volumes that we've never really faced before. And it's easy to say, 
um, you know, we're, we're great and we're welcoming and, you know, Canada is open to you when you're talking to a few dozen people. But now when that's like a few hundred thousand or... Well, we, know, were, we were navigating the traffic of Toronto today. Right. Now yeah. add tens of thousands of more and you're going to see nativist sentiment. But, you know, um, there's 250,000 Salvadorans in the U.S. right now. Over a third of them have a mortgage. They've been there for over a decade. Mm-hmm. That is home to them. Right. If Donald J. Trump, well, of course, he's canceled the TPS, September 2019th is D-Day. What is going to happen? These individuals, are they going to go back to El Salvador? I mean, a lot of their kids have been born in the U.S. Right. They have been in the U.S. for perhaps 15 plus years. Are they going to go back to one of the most dangerous countries in the world? I don't know. Are they going to make a refugee claim in Canada, even though they may not strictly fit the definition of refugee? I don't know. I I said earlier today that we may have to explore the option of an amnesty. And I think that a lot of people are going to, you know, literally freak out at that term. Um, But I don't see how else we can handle, if you're talking about hundreds of thousands of refugee claimants and a refugee determination system can handle 20,000 per year, and we already have a backlog backlog of 55,000, we are looking at an intractable problem. Like, look, I'm not... I've said this many times, I'm a pundit, I'm not a jochi. Um, I don't have a crystal ball, but there is this juala muki, there is a powder keg in the US. And mm-hmm. I, unlike other people, do not pretend to be able to predict what Donald Trump will do. Right. And so he will perhaps determine that concept of home and what home is for perhaps hundreds of thousands of people. I mean, there's 800,000 plus DACA and their parents. I mean, we may well see something that is unprecedented in terms of the U.S. We, We may well see some action that may well shock the conscience. I don't know. I hope not. I hope not. Let's, um, I hope that we can walk back from this precipice. We were talking about this earlier when, um, you know, when you, you think about an individual, you know, an individual situation, it, it's identifiable, it's human, and it seems tragic. But the moment you talk about it in the thousands or the millions, it's a statistic. And so, like, coming back down from 30,000 feet, things that you've seen, what are some memorable situations that you've come across with, with, with people you've talked to and clients and whatnot? Like, what are the reasons for leaving or coming, like... What is it that brings people here from people that you've actually met and, and, and spent time with? Well, I think anyone that truly flees a, an egregious situation, something that violates basic uh, human rights, uh, and I see it, and sometimes clients are very, very guarded, and we do the refugee claim, and then once they realize that they've succeeded, and then they break down. And individuals that I never thought would cry start crying in front of you. Um, you know, I, I did a Palestinian refugee not too long ago, very, very high up in the administration there. He was a whistleblower, and he and that that act endangered him and the lives of his family. And that reaction is sudden. It's it's incredibly credible because it's so spontaneous and so when you see that then you realize okay well they've they have burned all their bridges they've 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 crossed they've crossed the rubicon they've burned the bridges and canada's accepted them and that is a seminal moment in their lives and so to be part of that is of course very very gratifying and so i'm very grateful that i can engage in this meaningful act that you know, it is, there's some nobility in assisting them through and navigating this perilous journey. So there is, those those examples are what really sort of motivate me in in terms of stopping someone's deportation, particularly a child, Mm -hmm. a child that didn't make the decision to come to Canada, right, or was born in Canada and certainly didn't make the decision that their parents didn't have or had precarious status and might be going back to a country that they've never seen. And of course, my, my, 
my son, my children are about the same age as some of the children that I'm assisting. So many, many times I think really of those kids when I'm... So stopping those cases or their that deportation, and it's not really a deportation. They, they're Canadian. No one can force them to leave. But right. obviously they're going to be accompanying their parents. So that's those are the sort of cases that really sort of motivate you get you up in the morning get you reading those you know cracking those books still reading after so many years of doing this stuff so um and is to preserve that home right is to preserve the home i did and in particular for children Mm -hmm. this um the term expat gets thrown around a lot what uh in your mind is there any difference between that and immigrant yes there... uh expat is the term used for white people and immigrant is the term used for everyone else okay <laughs> yeah it's it's kind of funny how that works <laughs> or should i say expat in the past was used for white people and then now perhaps expat could be the term used for anyone from perhaps a G7 or G8 country um, so if right. I were to, you know, um, work in China, perhaps I'd be an expat, for example, or if I... Sure. Yeah, um, yeah. But uh, I think the expat term is a term, in my mind, I always laugh because if, they, if, it's, if it's a brown guy or a woman or, you know, of a melanin, increased melanin or enhanced melanin levels, then you're an immigrant. And if you're right. a white guy working in Singapore, you're an expat. When you when you hear terms like um, migrant or illegal alien, which is not used I don't, so much I don't, anymore, I don't use. I mean, that's a term in the U.S. I don't refer to human beings right. as aliens. But I mean, when when you when you hear these terms, yeah. like what does it what does it evoke in you? Like, what, it's an what, why do you term. think that they're? It's an offensive term because you're dehumanizing someone, and you're dehumanizing someone in the most blatant way possible. Right, you're calling them an alien. It's uh, I I kind of feel personally the same way about migrant because it doesn't um... a migrant on the term itself is not offensive in the sense of a migrant sure. is an individual in transit let's say and so uh, but you're right the people that use that term tend to frame it in their own way so if w- you or I were to say it it would mean exactly what it means. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, it's 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 funny because... And that, you know, and I was very clear, like, I don't refer to, right. for example, like, if they were say, oh, illegal border crosser or illegal or irregular border crosser, I'm like, no, nope, I'm not going to use either of those terms. I refer to them as border crossers. Well, right. And, and this, I mean, we keep, this this phrase keeps coming up, this, this whole death of nuance, but the idea yeah. that you can cross a border... Um, and file, you know, a refugee claim, you Legally. know, a port of entry, or like once you've actually landed, like there's actually a due process for that. You're section not technically one, illegal. Section at, at one thirty three of the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act, absolutely. But it's easy to take an image of someone coming into a, a, a border as a potential threat. May or you know, in in all likelihood, will probably have some elevated levels of melanin. And then to say that these people are jumping the queue, they are il- here illegally, um, and to kind of stoke sentiment that you've started to see the sort of the the resurgence of populism in in you know Western Europe and the U.S. and even to a degree right here where we you know we believe this is the greatest place ever, um, but yet those 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 sentiments still exist here and they're being stoked. How do we get to a place where people actually take the time to consider? any issue, you know, whether it's immigration or any other issue, and just kind of consider it a little bit more carefully and not just go off of a, a tweet, right, I'm, as as I, their news. I'm I'm really pessimistic on that. I think that we are in the post-nuance age. I, I really am not, uh, I don't have a lot of uh, optimism in this regard. I think that individuals make decisions based on emotion, and I think that immigration is one of those concepts and particularly this quote-unquote illegal or queue jumping or border crossing or it's one of those things that cannot be constrained so again if anyone thinks brexit is about bureaucrats in brussels deciding regulations regarding vegetables and the flame retardant materials inside flags instead of 
quote unquote hordes of brown people flowing into the US, then I've got a bridge to sell them mm-hmm. or perhaps a wall to sell them. Right. Yeah. No, it's, um, it's, it's hard but, to. But I mean, you understand, like, they evoked the loss of home in Brexit. Brexit was about loss. Right. Right. Brexit was about loss. And so that, that concept of it's home, it's mother, it's, you know, these are, these are chords that strike deep into our souls. So Brexit was about that. I think Trump, I, uh, don't tell me his Muslim ban, which he paraded in his, um, you know, run up to the election. I mean, of, of course that played a role. I right. think that fear of loss and the fear of the loss of home is a very motivating factor. And, and it was uh, more of a motivating fa- factor for Trump and his base than it was like optimism, for example, for Hillary Clinton. Like, yes, she can. I don't know. I can't even remember what the hell her um, slogans were. But Trump certainly evoked home again. Trump evoked Reagan again. He used the same line as Reagan, mm-hmm. make America great again. He's evoking this concept of nostalgia as if the 50s were anything great except for guys like Trump. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. And that's the thing. Like, you can stoke, you can sort of, you can, we, we got to do something about that old monk. It <laughs> definitely needs to be replenished. Um, but you can you can stoke those those sentiments, I think, quite easily. Now we're, yeah. it's interesting that we're seeing this resurgence now. And I th- I'm... I'm sometimes surprised and yet not that this wave is kind of hitting us. I mean, whether it's someone like Doug Ford getting elected premier in this province or, you know, the rise of even like Canadian born, like right wing extremist white supremacist groups or the sort of anti-immigration, um, the the wave of like just Twitter noise that I saw around when that guy drove down Young Street and mowed down all those people. Every time something like that happens, the first reaction that people have is that, oh, it's sympathetic Justin Trudeau who's letting in all of these, like these immigrants and these Muslim and Middle Eastern immigrants in particular and whatnot. And it just turns into this hysteria. And this is right here. But you know, and, like, you know, my, I talked to my parents a couple of weeks ago. Even my parents expressed concern about these border crossers. Right. I mean, yeah. that's, it, it is. These are, again, when we pick immigrants, we're accepting of them because there's a concept of agency and choice. Mm -hmm. When individuals sort of pick us and foist themselves on us, I mean, it does affect individuals in a certain way. It does affect that. And I don't want to sort of just blow it off. And, you know, the panelist today was, again, a French national. He's, he's a little bit more laissez-faire about these feelings. I don't want to blow those feelings off. Mm-hmm. They're legitimate. These sentiments are legitimate. I, I can argue with facts and numbers and statistics, and, sure. but it won't change their feelings. I am right. cognizant of those feelings, and I, I want to respect those feelings as well. I, and because you know, my own parents have, have raised it because the, the imagery of the border crossers is affecting this deep-seated Canadian concept of the Q, i.e. there's an orderly process to enter Canada and they are somehow skipping the line. Mm-hmm. Now, again, hard to convince anyone otherwise who believes in that. Right. And I may not even have fully convinced my own parents. Right. So this may well be a losing battle in terms of anyone that is arguing on on this side of like... How do we know we have to give them a fair shake? We have to give them their hearing. I think that if you look at the the phenomena that is Trump, I believe a significant part of the reason that it was as much of a surprise to the you know the establishment. It may have been a complete surprise to him. I mean, he yeah, certainly, he uh, looked yeah, shell shocked. Yeah, 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 I like, mean, are you? I think his serious? wife. Like, I think his wife yeah. was also shell shocked. Yeah, but I mean. If you were a Trump supporter, I can only imagine in many parts of the U.S., and it's not maybe that you were necessarily a Trump supporter, but nothing else in the options really spoke to you. And the moment you said that you're, you're, you're planning to vote for Trump, and it might not be because you're voting for Trump, it's because you're voting Republican or whatever reason. Or you're voting against Hillary Clinton. Or you're voting against Hillary Clinton. Immediately, I can just see the swarms of people saying, you're a racist, you're a bigot, you're an asshole, you're all of these things. And the moment you just sort of come down on somebody without actually opening up a dialogue and understanding, okay, what is 
what's sort of the underlying root cause of you feeling this way? What makes you feel that this is a better option or that that's a terrible option? And if you shut that conversation down before and it I, happens, and I don't, you never I, hear I don't want to, I don't want to shut that because you know, again, the you know my my panelists were kind of like had this sort of uh, you know shrugging their shoulders attitude. I mean, these claims will cost us money. It's going to be about 50,000 per claim and do the math. You got 50,000, you got about 30,000 in the last 18 months. That's quite a bit. And right. I don't want a sea change in Canadian attitudes towards immigration, so I am concerned on that front. Right. And at some point to the uninformed, it's so easy to conflate refugees, immigrants through the the standard processes and people who might be, you know, second or third generation from other parts of the world. Like it's to, to the to the uninformed, to the uninitiated, it would almost seem like you can just kind of roll everybody up into well, you a know, group, one, right? One thing that I found concerning is that again, you know, this UNHCR representative is is talking, well, you know, the numbers that Canada took in is nothing next to Bangladesh. Why are we comparing ourselves to Bangladesh? Mm-hmm. We are not next to Burma. Why are we comparing ourselves to Lebanon? We are not contiguous or close to Syria, for example. We're Canada. We're bordered by two oceans and the Arctic and the U.S. to the south. For us, for Canadians, this is a very, very significant issue because we've never seen these numbers before, for example. And so I don't know. I think, you know, downplaying this issue and dismissing the concerns of average Canadians, Joe Sixpack, the the mythical Joe Sixpack, I think is a recipe for disaster. Everyone has a notion of home, Mm -hmm. Which, right? You, which you raised, and I, and now I realize, you know, at first I was questioning whether can I talk about this concept that you want me to talk about because my business is about everything after you leave home. But I believe, like for example, this issue is about preserving home, and so you dismiss these feelings of my home is being affected, or my home will not be the home that I remember, or there's going to be this sort of irref- irrevocable change, irremedial change. Um, dismiss that at your cost. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, Justin Trudeau has been been very, very lucky in terms of his his lackluster opposition and you know the uh, you know the, the the you know Jagmeet Singh in terms of the NDP. But I don't know. Okay. If it was anyone else, this issue would, if anyone else were to bring this issue up, I mean, you know, like, you remember Star Trek where, like, they go into that parallel universe and yeah. Spock is evil, but he's got yeah. the goatee and yeah. Kirk, like, if I was why evil... Why do you always, you have to have a goatee when you're the evil version you of You got yourself. to, you like, got to why? remember, like, even, like, in India, right? Obviously, the, the rapist always had, like, the mustache or, or whatever, <laughs> right? But, I mean, you know, like, if I was evil <laughs> Spock, yeah, I mean this issue could be easily parlayed into electoral victory and defeat for defeat for the liberals for sure but um let's see what happens it's it's the jury's out i don't know i don't know i believe that this immigration and border crossers this issue will be for the first time a significant issue in a canadian election right I, I was hearing sort of chatter about this, and then I asked you this question earlier, and I was I was actually like just again just pleading ignorance. I didn't didn't know better, but I was asking if we've had any significant numbers of Rohingya Muslim claims from people who fled Burma are are currently refugees in Bangladesh, but fleeing just unimaginable levels of persecution and and horrors and whatnot. And and you told me something about just the logistics of even filing a claim and ending up here in the first place. Can you talk yeah, a like bit more in about terms of, in terms of our concept of what a quote unquote real refugee is, those individuals never get to Canada because to get to Canada you need to get at a minimum a visitor visa or student visa or some kind of visa to get here. Now, no Canadian officer is going to give a visitor visa to someone that won't return, that someone that's in dire straits, someone that doesn't have enough funds for their trip. So Canada won't give them a visitor visa to begin with. And again, this is another co- example of how we're actually more stingy than the U.S. The U.S. might actually give them visitor visas, but Canada wouldn't. So give- are there certain, is it a case-by-case basis, or are there certain countries that Canada does not give vis- visitor visas to? Interestingly enough, I mean, like the Globe and Mail 
you know, ran an article, they, they had over 70, 75% rejection rate from certain countries. A lot of those countries were the exact same countries that are on the U.S. Muslim ban. So it's almost as if we have a Muslim ban, except we just don't call it a Muslim ban. We just reject every single visitor visa application that comes from Somalia mm-hmm. or Sudan or, you know, Yemen or, right? So, I mean, we just, it's a Muslim ban, but hey, a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. And a Muslim ban by any other name would still be racist or... right. I mean, it's obviously something that's close to home, like no pun intended for for all of us. And I think that it's just something that we have to have useful, intelligent, nuanced discussions about, right? Like, and it's just, I think it's a shame when I see people, um, in some ways, technology has sort of empowered us to connect with people in, in to degrees we've never would have been able to. But like when it turns into 140 character shouting matches at each other without actually really kind of listening. And I, you're right, like talking to, if Joe Sixpack says like, like, fuck, man, I don't want any immigrants here or whatever. Like, I mean, you can say, look, you're you're racist, you're bigoted and whatnot. Or you could say, tell me more about why you feel that way. Like, what but is he, it What but, is it in your experience that's remember, kind of led to that? You know, but remember, he's not actually saying that. He's, well, yeah. He, he's, he's, he's actually raising a nuanced question. Sure, yeah, yeah. And so, and that question, does, because if he simply said, I don't want any more immigrants, then the conversation's over. Mm-hmm. But what I'm hearing is, wait what exactly is happening and what's changed from before and why is this unprecedented sort of surge? And so these are all legitimate questions and we have to engage in that. It's not, this is not knee jerk, uh, you know, anti-immigrant rhetoric that I'm hearing. This is legitimate sort of concerns like, okay, well how, what's changed now? Right. Well, I mean, he might not be saying like, uh, uh, I, I don't want any immigrants, period. He might not be saying it in, in, in so many words, but like if you were to deconstruct and understand, maybe on a day-to-day basis, he has, uh, you know, a, a Somali doctor and he has like, you yeah. know, like the, you know, the, the person who's his accountant is from another background and moved here 10 years ago or whatever. And you saw maybe his day-to-day life and it's already filled with this sort of mix of people to begin with. Um, but if you never actually kind of heard him out, and you just kind of took him at face value at the thing that he just said once, and you never really kind of deconstructed it. You would never have this nuanced discussion to understand what's actually bugging him. And if you can't get to the root cause of something, you think, can't address that. Well, I and think, I think that's what we do today. The perniciousness of this and in the U.S. and in Brexit is that this concept of the border crossers or these migrants is striking at the heart of identity. So whenever mm-hmm. you have something that threatens identity, it is going to be something that, and there's no logic that will then overcome that. And so this is why we have to tread cautiously, and this is why I hope our politicians tread cautiously, because, and again, these loaded terms, every time I hear these loaded terms, I'm going to push back and I'm going to say, like, look, I don't agree with these terms. I don't agree with this premise. And these terms and this these loaded premises actually do harm than they do right. good. But when you say like like tread cautiously, but you're not also saying that like we have to. There's certain conversations that we should or should not be having, or that anyone shouldn't be privy to. Tread right? cautiously in the sense of like you are, you know, there's a semantic battle between the liberals and the conservatives: irregular border crossers versus illegal. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a loaded term and it adds nothing to the conversation. In fact, what it does is it stokes nativist sentiment. Right. And the actual nuanced answer is that it's neither. Right. Is it irregular? Well, it's expressly provided for by the law. Is it illegal? Well, technically, but another provision contravenes it or stays it or suspends it. And so, uh, you know, why, why go into this? I find that like in this, I mean, this is just one of many topics and, you know, hopefully we'll get, you know, opportunities to talk about a lot more in the future here. But in this, in this death of nuance, I think a lot of that death of nuance is actually by this homogenization of opinion, right? So for example, and we were talking about this earlier, being a, you know, homogenization of opinion or polarization of opinion. Well, so there is, because there, what, there is a we, polarization. what we now see is this sort of, polarized, homogenized yes, reaction, yeah, yeah. i.e. on this side, I can tell you exactly what the argument is right? or yeah. the speaking notes here. And I, then on this other side, I can tell you exactly 
what those arguments yeah so it's and, both yeah. it's, it's homogenization and polarization it's taking something that's uh you know countless shades of gray and turning it into a similar like just a, a you know a binary black and white and it, from that from that perspective i it's difficult and i've seen it firsthand i, I see it day in day out like to be a middle-aged blonde-haired blue-eyed white man today who is saying something that would otherwise be considered rational can be so quickly misconstrued as racist. But if you happen well, to let's be, well, not, let's not. Be, it's not always the case, not, but there is some to some degree. I think uh, let's not. Uh, you know, it's a little early yet to to jump to to that defense yet. I think there's quite a you know there's quite a bit of privilege still at play. Oh, for sure. And so I'm you know forgive me for my lack of sympathy for a little bit yet. Um we'll see. We'll see. I think we are now getting some diversity of opinion. Well, I I think and, I, maybe more what I was getting is not to say that there isn't privilege and there's clearly many ills that have been committed by blonde-haired, blue-eyed, you know, men over history. But at the same time if Joe Sixpack happening to be from one physically identifiable background versus another, that opinion may carry certain weight in certain circles, but you know, this in this sort of bipolar left and right uh, continuum that we're operating in. And I think that that's what's unfortunate is to just look at somebody and not actually hear out their opinion just because of what you see. I hope that there is just more discussion regardless of what background someone comes from. I agree. I think it is a recipe for disaster to do what, again, I think a co-panelist was suggesting today, which is to dismiss those concerns as being completely unfounded. I have respect for those views, even if I disagree with them. Right. So, I mean, just then on that note, like out of respect for, for your time, and you've been very generous with it, I appreciate you, and, you being uh, here. Respect for my empty glass... Yeah, which we will have to uh, remedy yes. very quickly. But if anyone wants to kind of keep up to date with what you're up to, where can they follow you? Where can they find out more? Um, I tweet perhaps more than I should. That's uh, at IM Lawyer Canada. Uh, so I M M Lawyer Canada. Um, I've got a blog. I've got obviously the website uh, for the firm. It's Rod Sharma. I'm sure you can. People will be able to find me. Uh, it's uh, it's something that I've enjoyed engaging with. I really appreciate it. I know you're, you know, just uh, bouncing ideas off you. Um, you've always, you know, been fantastic that way. I mean, even if obviously you're not in this field at all, but it's still very, very useful just to hang out with you. And, uh, you know, even not a lot has changed after two decades, but uh, it, I think yeah. it worked out well um, today. And I, I hope I was able to bring some more, light i mean this this conversation always brings up you know more heat than light and right. more noise than signal so hopefully it worked out today let's see um we always have to do our best uh in this regard and hopefully it works out but you know people will make the decisions that they make and i wonder what will happen in the next couple of months it could be uh, a momentous sea change for canada if uh if what I fear happens. Right. Well, I mean, I, I will sleep a little bit better knowing that someone like you is at <laughs> least on the front lines of this because uh, we definitely need more nuanced and honest and open people like you. So thank you so much again. My pleasure, brother. If you'd like to support the Awoken Word podcast, there are many ways you can do it. You can subscribe, in your app of choice. We're on iTunes, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, or TuneIn, for example. The biggest thing that you can do is rate this podcast and leave your review in iTunes or wherever you listen to it. You can also talk about this podcast, its guests, or the ideas shared on it in your own podcasts. If you find benefit in this show, tell your friends, tell your family, and even more importantly, Tell your enemies. They'll appreciate it too. And of course, you can also follow us on social media, particularly on Twitter. Our handle there is at Awoken Word, on Instagram as at Awoken Word Podcast, or on our Facebook page. Thank you. Your support is greatly appreciated. <laughs>